So hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. I'm super excited because our guest, his name is Charlton Hall. We're here to talk to him about a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, primarily, we're going to talk about his book called Tin Foil Aliens, How to Fake an Alien Invasion. And um, as I was talking to Charlton before, I mentioned to him that since we do interview a, a lot of ufologists and we hear about UFO abductions and alien uh, sightings, I wanted to bring to you guys a, a different perspective and how easily all of this can be hoaxed, whether it's a PSYOP or maybe it's this sheep men herd mentality we have that's making us believe this stuff. But he wrote a very comprehensive book. He's uh, a retired psychotherapist and an author. He's been engaged in this research for decades, right, Charlton? Uh, yes, since the 70s. <laughs> right, since the 70s. Prior to his retirement, you are a family um, and family marriage and 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 uh, therapist, right? Counselor, yes, that uh, type of thing, supervisor. Family therapist, yes. Uh -huh. Right. You have a bachelor's degree in experimental psychology, a master's mm -hmm. degree in marriage and family therapy, and a doctorate in transpersonal counseling. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Wonderful. So, um, let's let's dive right in. And again. Let's kind of reiterate why we're here today. Like, give us your 30,000 foot perspective as to w what the purpose of this is all about. Okay, sure. Um, back in the 70s, when I was uh, preteen and uh, first became a teenager, uh, some friends of mine and I did a ser series of uh, fake UFOs. Um, did it back when I was a kid, didn't really think any more about it. And then in the current environment where there seems to be a conspiracy theory every five minutes, I decided maybe, maybe it's the time to explain how easy it is to do this and what are some of the ways that people perpetuate hoaxes and what are some of the ways that you can tell if a hoax has been perpetuated or not. And um, some people might get the impression by reading this book that I'm um, totally deny the presence of UFOs and deny the presence of aliens. Uh, that's not true. I just like to apportion my uh, belief in a phenomenon to the amount of evidence that we have. If you think about the fact that uh, there are more grains of sand, uh, more stars in the known universe than there are grains of sand on every beach in the entire planet, then you get an idea of just how many potential planets there are out there that might have life on them. Now, that's different than saying, well, yes, they came to me and, and uh, we had a big conversation and that sort of thing. So the, the general idea behind the book is uh, this is how we faked all this stuff. And this is why we did it. And this is uh, how you can tell if it's a hoax or not so that people don't get uh, taken in by these readily apparent hoaxes. One of the big things about this is because I am interested in UFOs, and possible alien contact and all of that, I like for folks to be able to have some sense of credibility about them. So if, if we're taken in by every little hoax that comes along, then people are going to look at us, you know, like those guys will believe anything and then it's not taken seriously. I believe uh, that we should take this thing seriously. You might be familiar with the uh, work of J. Allen Hynek, who came up with the post encounter scale. He looks at it from a scientific perspective, and I think that's what we should be doing is looking at it from a scientific perspective. And that's one of the many reasons I wrote the book. That's an excellent answer. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, of course, we have so many questions for you, but um, yeah. so that, that was the driving force behind your book then, right? Yes. To just expose this and give people, um, you know, food for thought. And especially nowadays, there's so many sightings. Um, what do you think is accounting for all of the sightings globally and especially the ones released by the government, you know, the TikTok ones and stuff like that? Yeah. All these authorities coming out and commission hearings and what what's the mechanism behind that, do you think? Um everybody has a camera now. <laughs> so if any any strange thing at all shows up, you can just whip out your camera and video it. Another one is that you can uh, download uh, software for free that makes it very easy to fake things like this. Another one is that um, the perpetuation of um, social media. Um, 
for example, like if you have uh, YouTube, one of the ways that people make money on YouTube is to get people to view their videos. And one of the ways that they do that is to make videos that people want to watch. Mm -hmm. And would you rather watch um, a 15 minute video on uh, how to, uh, you know, clean the house? Or would you rather watch a 15 minute video on UFOs and aliens? <laughs> so there's some incentive there. There's some, some financial incentive there for creating these UFO videos, that sort of thing. That makes total sense. Um, so you put l so many decades, I think since you were 13, right? It's in your book. Uh, yeah, actually it was, a, we were about 10 or 11 years old when we did the first one. Uh, this is over 50 years ago. So it's, <laughs> I mean, I have the dates exactly right, but it was, yeah, somewhere along in there, about 10 or 11. That's really young to be thinking. Yeah. 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 I, mean, I was like so impressed with that, that you had that drive within you as a young kid to like, disprove yeah back back in the day there was no internet or no video games so we had to entertain ourselves the best way we could so we had uh, uh, and most of my circle of friends were sons and daughters of engineers and scientists so so we had ready access to a lot of things that uh, we probably shouldn't have had it's looking back on it <laughs> right. like gunpowder and things like that sure sure you would yeah. it was incredible you the book is so comprehensive. Like I literally have to read it again because I was like underlining stuff as I'm, <laughs> and I, it quite changed my perspective on a lot of this too. It kind of, it didn't, it didn't change my, my like belief system. I believe there's something going on for sure, whether it's government uh, top secret, you know, ships or whatever, but it yeah. made it cohesive for me and, and, in so many ways to not always believe what, what I see. I mean, look at, um, you know, what they're doing on the internet too, with deep fakes and stuff like that. So it's, it's yeah. just an excellent read. It really pulls things together for the reader. So I highly recommend that. Thanks. One of the things that I like to, to say regarding all that is, uh, I think we talked about it in the pre-chat that uh, people might get the impression by reading this that I totally deny aliens and ufos and all that i like to draw the distinction between what i believe and what i can prove to be true or what i know to be true and and uh, while i do believe that there could possibly be aliens living among us or talking to us in some way i don't have any credible evidence that would stand up to scientific scrutiny for that myself personally that doesn't mean that there aren't people out there who do it just means that I choose to uh, say, okay, I, I would like to believe that aliens might be here and they might have visited us, but that doesn't mean that I can concretely prove it in uh, a way that would meet scientific rigor, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes total sense. Why do you think the government has all of a sudden started to become more transparent about these things and releasing this footage, documentation, people, testimonies, stuff like that? Mm -hmm. Part of the, <laughs> this is probably not a good thing to say on a book about how to detect <laughs> conspiracies, but uh, I think part of it might be a government dis conspiracy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> They're trying to detract from something else. Anytime, uh, um, one of the things we talk about in the book is uh, I was an amateur mag magician from very early age. I like to try to uh, figure out how they did magic tricks. And one of the first rules of magic tricks is you detract from what you're doing over here to to hide what you're doing over there right so i think that might be part of what's going on here and it could be some legitimate things going on too that there could be actual you know aliens out there somewhere that they actually have evidence of and um, they're just releasing it but on the other hand it could just be that uh, there's something happening in the government that they're trying to detract your attention by releasing all the ufo stuff and i'm not saying either one of those is accurate while the other one isn't i'm just saying I'm presenting all the possibilities yeah a lot of people speculate that as well one yeah. of the things that intrigued me is you talk about um uh, in great depth like confirmation bias cognitive biases psychological mm. ops stuff like that yes um how do you think that fits into this whole thing i mean you've witnessed it for decades how people are so easily duped and you know, we've read about studies like what was that study where they made uh, a bunch of people electrocute somebody 
by just giving them orders? What was the name? Oh, uh, that? that was the Stanley Milgram stuff. Yeah, yes. <laughs> that was pretty amazing stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. And and basically all it meant was that if there's a guy in a lab coat telling you that it's okay to torture people, <laughs> because some guy in a white lab coat said it's okay. That blew me away how easily yeah. people are coerced into doing things. So where does this all play in our confirmation bias and so on? Like, how does that uh, play into it? In um, in our belief in, in UFOs. Like, we're so yeah. easily, you see a video and you just believe it. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. most people well, do. Well, uh, that's, um, in, in, uh, without going too far into the scientific method, one of the uh, basics of scientific investigation, there's a thing called type one, type two errors. Mm -hmm. I always get them mixed up. <laughs> if, I, if I get this wrong, uh, <laughs> feel free to correct me in the comments. <laughs> but um, type one error, I believe, is seeing a pattern that isn't there. And a type two error is not seeing a pattern that is there. Um, a type one error is something called apophenia or pareidolia, mm. where you see uh, a pattern when there's not really a pattern there. Just to give you an example, um, if you remember back, I think it was the early 80s where everybody was getting into this reverse masking thing where if you play a rock and roll song backwards, it supposedly has all these satanic messages and all that sort of stuff. Um, if you just listened to a, a recording played backwards and somebody asked you, well, what does it say? Then you have a hard time. It sounds like gibberish to me. But if somebody says, okay, this, this record is saying hail Satan and, uh, you know, this sort of thing, sacrifice children or whatever. And then you listen to it, you can hear it and say, oh, wow, that's exactly what that sounds like. It's sort of the same thing as uh, when you're a kid looking up at the clouds and saying, oh, I see an elephant or I see a Mickey Mouse or whatever. That pattern is not really there. Your mind has just tricked you into perceiving that that pattern is there. So in the case of UFOs, it might be you see um well pick on a cliche here <laughs> there's the planet venus that looks like a flying saucer because i've never seen it before in mm. that part of the sky so you, your brain has tricked you into seeing something that's not really there that sort of thing the other side the type two errors is um uh, that's that's a caution to the folks that uh like to totally deny any possible or any potential evidence of ufos not seeing a pattern that is there. <laughs> so there could be that there is actually some kind of UFO contact going on or some kind of alien visitation, and we're just not seeing it because we're not looking at all the evidence. So the way you distinguish between type one and type two errors and prevent yourself from making those is to look at all the evidence available on both sides of the issue, for the issue and against the issue, and then weigh those together and see which, which side has the most evidence. And based on the quality of the evidence and how much evidence there is, make your decision there. Now, that's not always foolproof, but it's on the average, if you look at it, it's more foolproof than just saying, oh, I want to believe this and, and not looking at any evidence to the contrary. How do you get um, a herd mentality like ours, though, to take the time to look at like the science first and to understand like a lot of the concepts that you wrote about how easily we could be tricked by pareidolia and things like that. How yeah. do you convince, you know, billions of people on the planet not to believe what their eyes are telling them and see, showing them in a video and, and, yeah. and with the videos everywhere um, it's, it's just mind blowing to see, you know, this triangle shaped UFO in the sky and mm -hmm. then tell somebody it's, you know, it's not real. It's you're imagining it or it's a government psyop. Like, how do you get the message out there? Um, well, to start with, uh, I think uh, I, I had uh, an experience myself with a triangle UFO that mm -hmm. we talk about in the book. Um, if you if somebody tells you that, like if I told somebody, OK, I saw this triangle UFO and you tell them, no, you didn't see it, then you just made a type two error. <laughs> so it's, it's not necessarily telling them you're wrong and this doesn't actually happen. It's okay, well, here's the evidence pro and here's the evidence con. Um, I can't remember. I think it was Thomas Paine that said that you can't reason with someone who's abandoned reason. Mm. And, and what that means is that if you're determined to believe something out of a need to believe it and not willing to look at the evidence that goes against your beliefs, then 
at that point, there's no no sense in trying to reason with the person because they've already made up their mind and nothing you can say is going to change that. One of the questions I always ask when I'm confronted with someone like that is, what evidence would convince you that your opinion is wrong? Mm -hmm. And if they can't answer that, then at that point, the conversation is done because they're not looking at all the evidence. And, and at that point, there's no the point no point in arguing with them <laughs> because they've already made up their minds and their minds are not based on evidence it's just based on the need to believe that confirmation bias that exactly. cognitive bias. yeah so it's a willingness and that goes for both sides of the fence the type one and the type two uh, if you're stubbornly saying I refuse to believe uh, that an alien has landed even after they park the car on or park the the vehicle on the White House lawn and go in and ask to speak to the president then you're just as guilty as the person who's saying, uh, I saw a mysterious light in the sky, and that means that uh, UFOs are here, that sort of thing. So you're looking at the evidence on both sides and trying to make a, de a decision based on the quality of the evidence on both sides. And again, that's not always awesome. foolproof, mm -hmm. but it's the best method we've come up with so far. Right. Now, in your book, you go through like some of the most famous cases of you know uh, people that have been abducted and whatnot. I found that so interesting. Uh, Barney and Betty Hill and so on. What about Travis Walton though? For some reason, his story always um, like struck a chord within me that, that it was truthful. I mean, he had numerous lie detector exams and whatnot. And mm -hmm. it seemed to be like really legit. What What's your take on his story? Well, one of the things uh, I, I do want to say something about lie detectors and I'll give you the take on the Travis Walton. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I am a psychotherapist and um one of the things that I used to do in marriage and family therapy is I, I had to appear in uh, family court quite a bit. And as part of that, I had to prepare witnesses for family court and tell them this is what is likely to happen. This is how you should present that sort of thing. And once in a while, an attorney would show up and say, well, take a lie detector test, prove that you're not uh, getting drunk every night by taking a lie detector test. Um, I can teach you how to fool a lie detector in 10 minutes. It's wow. not, it's not anything. It's not based on uh, whether or not you're actually telling the truth. It's based on physiological responses to uh, stimuli. So they have these sensors that they attach to your body and uh, you can um, make your body by, by certain techniques, you can make your body respond in ways that make you look like you're telling the truth. And, um, there's one called the thumbtack method. You might want not want to look that up if you're skittish. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, you put a thumbtack in your shoe, and, and any time they ask you a question that you want to sound like you're honest on, you or you push down on the thumbtack so that it causes you pain, and that makes you your heart rate go up and, and your skin change and all that. But that's one of the reasons that they don't allow um, lie detector tests and testimony for court anymore in most jurisdictions. Now that might be some place in some rural backwater that they still do that. But uh, the general consensus among the psychological and psychiatric community is that lie detector tests are not reliable. So the fact that he might've passed a lie detector test doesn't carry a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. um, he did flunk the first one he took. <laughs> oh, is that right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, the second one is, um, again, this goes into looking at all the evidence for and against and then making a decision there. I'm not um, saying that yes or no, it happened one way or the other, but at the time that it allegedly happened to him, um, he was in a severe amount of debt. He had, he had uh, underbid. He was a contractor and he had underbid on a lot of contracts and then found out that he didn't have the resources to, to to deliver on those contracts. Mm. So he was about to go bankrupt and be sued by the company that he made the contracts with and everything. So just about before he was about to be indicted for that, that's when the aliens abducted him. Oh, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not saying that, you know, it could just be a coincidence that the aliens happen to look at and say, okay, there's this guy named Travis. We need to give him a little help here. So let's go abduct him so he can get out of his bankruptcy. But, um, that may or may not be the case. Um, mm. I mean, it could be that he was actually abducted and that that's what happened. But um, again, just looking at all the possible motives for why this happened. Um, and, and to perpetuate a lie for mm. decades like that. I mean, you know, it just struck yeah. me as 
like you really need to be a, a special kind of person to do something like that. Well, and, and in his case, if he went back on it, then he's subject to right. <laughs> lawsuits. True, true, true. <laughs> is there any yeah. case that is, you know, in the public eye that you would say has the, the most amount of proof of abduction? Because I don't think amount of proof of abduction. Yeah. And, like that they were really abducted, like that you kind of tend to believe in this particular abduction. Um, well, as far as uh, the Barney and Betty Hill thing, um, I can understand the um, evidence both for and against. So I'm not saying that I totally believe in Barney and Betty Hill, but out of all the uh, cases, that's the one that has the most amount of credible evidence. And that's just because I'm a trained hypnotherapist and I know, um, number one, it's very easy to implant false memories in somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, um, number two, the um, evidence produced by hypnotherapy is not allowed in court either. It's kind of along the same lines as um, mm -hmm. lie detector tests. They're not allowed in evidence because they're so it's so wishy washy. It's so easy, and unless you're very very well trained in hypnosis and hypnotherapy, it's easy to uh, miss how somebody might implant a memory in somebody. But uh, given the fact that there's a lot of transcripts and a lot of uh, data, uh, the book, The Interrupted Journey, um, if you've ever read that, it goes into uh, the actual transcripts of the hypnosis sessions. And uh, the fact that uh, Barney um, denied it quite a bit. And he's like, I, uh, I, I, there's a thing in the book, a scene in the book after uh, the whole experience happened, Betty looks at Barney and says, now do you believe in UFOs? And he says, of course not. Are you crazy? You know, that sort of thing. Right. So he spent the majority of the time that this was being investigated, denying that it ever happened and thinking that it was, I believe he called them Nazis at one point in time <laughs> right. because they were all dressed in uniforms and, and that sort of thing. Um, and again, not saying that I believe that that actually happened, but just saying that if you had to look at the evidence in favor, which one would be the most, um, uh, yeah potentially credible and there's still some problems with all that as well but um that i go into those in the book and, and you know that's uh, <laughs> um probably another story but yeah I, I i don't know it's it's like you know they make documentaries about these things and they make them so compelling uh, that people just automatically believe them you also touched upon how to spot a hoax in what 10 steps or something yeah yeah which i thought was brilliant could could we kind of just go over that uh, I'll have to bring it back up. Let me see. <laughs> I just <laughs> I love mean, that. I, I have all the 10 steps, but I don't have them memorized in order. So let me pull that up real quick. Okay, sure. Um, number one, inconsistencies in visual appearance. Um, the idea there is just, um, does it look like something you've seen before? Does it look like uh, a legitimate something from outer space? Or does it look like something that uh, you might have seen before? Um, there, there's a picture in the book where was it George Adamski? I think it was one of the George Adamski, uh, UFOs where I show the picture of the alleged Adamski UFO and then a Coleman lantern from the same time period. And the Coleman lantern top is the UFO. Another one is with the Billy Meyer UFOs. There's a very visible trash can lid and something called the wedding yes. cake UFO. <laughs> when we're done um, going yeah. over these, I want to touch back on the yeah. Billy Meyer thing too. So Okay, sure. And uh, the, the point being to all that is that, um, yes, and it could be a legitimate UFO that just happens to look like a Coleman lantern lid. But given the possibilities that um, there's a uh, Coleman lantern lid or it's an actual UFO, uh, which one looks more like something that might be from an alien planet. So that that's, that's the first step there. Second one is unusual flight patterns. Mm -hmm. And um, that is um, UFOs are known for making seemingly impossible um, flights. Like they would take off at a 90 degree angle uh, going at a high rate of speed. And if you were a human being in a craft like that, it would kill you because the genetic, uh, the G forces would just splatter you up against the wall. So do they have any unusual flight patterns or could it be something like, um, one of the common things, and I know this is almost a cliche too, is, uh, balloons. 
um, the, that people see something that's a weather balloon or a, uh, another type of balloon and assume there's a UFO. Um, but the balloons fly and they don't make 90 degree turns. <laughs> they don't move <laughs> rapidly across the, the landscape, that sort of thing. So that, that's the idea of the, uh, um, how do they fly? Mm. Uh, next one is overly detailed descriptions and um, what that means. And, and this is uh, one of the things from therapy that I used to do too. We're, we're trained on um, detecting, um, I won't say detecting lies, but detecting when someone might be misrepresenting what's going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, none of these are a hundred percent foolproof. So if I mention one thing, that doesn't mean that if this person is doing that, that, uh, that they're definitely lying. It's kind of like, a, I call it the grapes mentality. You're looking for clusters here and the more, mm -hmm grapes you find in a cluster the more likely it is that you got a grape <laughs> you know i like that uh, so so if uh, someone one of the one of the uh, signs of lying or being dishonest is overly detailed descriptions like oh, uh, right. say you're coming into work and the boss says uh, why were you late and you say well i was stuck in traffic that tends to indicate you were honest if the boss says why were you late uh, you say well, I was on my way to work and, uh, and then I had a flat tire and then I had to change that. And then there was, you know, this, that, and then you get this uh, 15 minute story with all these details that tends to be more uh, of a fake, if that makes I sense. I like that. That's yeah. a good red flag right there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you, you can probably see that with uh, a lot of these when that happens. Um, for lack of multiple witnesses, how many folks do you have? that are actually um, seeing this phenomenon. Now, one of the things that happens quite a bit is that you have to watch for, and I've seen this on uh, several different things. Um, I, there was 20 people that saw this. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have one guy telling me there were 20 people that saw this. That's different than having 20 people tell me they saw this. <laughs> So, okay, do you have names and addresses of these 20 people? Can I go talk to them and verify that they all ha saw the same thing? And just and because to, I not, say, yeah. Not to interrupt you, but what, since sure. it's related, um, what about mm -hmm. uh, the witnesses that were in the Arizona when they saw the triangle? I mean, weren't there thousands the, of witnesses for that? The so, Phoenix Lights, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, there were thousands of witnesses that saw the Phoenix Lights. Mm -hmm. um, there were a few of them that said that they saw a black triangle. There is no video that I'm aware of, of a black triangle or no photograph of a black triangle. I'm not saying that there wasn't a black triangle there. I'm just saying I haven't seen any of the. <laughs> you think but, that was mass hysteria then? I mean. Um, well, it could be. Um, the, the, one of the things that um, I look at on that is if there were thousands of witnesses, why didn't they all see the black triangle? Why did only some people see the black triangle? Ah. Yeah. So, and that, that's another thing that we get into with analyzing witness testimony or is everybody seeing the same thing? And that's kind of a, uh, a gray area. And what I mean by that is if you have a, some people seeing a black triangle and some people seeing just the lights, then uh, one of the ways that you try to determine if the witness testimony is accurate is do they all tell a same story or the or similar story or or is the divergence easy to explain mm -hmm. um and that's where the gray area comes in it could be that the ones that just saw the lights didn't see the black triangle because it was dark and it was too high up or, or whatever and the other folks that saw the black triangle because um, they were in an area or at an angle that made it possible to see the triangle so that's where the finesse comes in how how much uh benefit of the doubt are you willing to give that that sort of thing if that makes sense it does so what what was that number four or five on the list uh that was number four okay so let's let's yeah number five inconsistent season time and location and there's a little bit of variability in that and what i mean by that is if i if i tell you i saw a ufo at noon and you say well it was about 12 30 or one o'clock when i saw the ufo that could be just within the realm of I wasn't exactly looking at my watch when this happened, so I don't know exactly. If I tell you that uh, I saw it on April 1st and the same incident occurred on April 30th, um, 
and two different witnesses saw it at different times, but it was supposed to be the same incident, then that UFO was in the air for a long time. <laughs> True. So, so the idea there is, is, is the location the same? Did they get the location right? Did they get the, um, the time right? Another, just to use an example of location. Uh, I saw it over here um, behind this building or over this building. No, it wasn't there. It was over there. Mm. Um, well, it could have moved, but how how much? And again, you're comparing all the witness testimony and, and that, that gray area of how much credence do we give, how reliable are the witnesses, does the time and location uh, jibe up with what, what they're saying there, if that makes sense. It does. Um, photographic or video anomalies. Mm-hmm. This you could probably do a whole podcast. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, um, I was a graphic artist. I worked my way through school uh, as a graphic artist, and um, as a matter of fact, I didn't go back and get my uh, graduate degrees until I was in my forties because I was a graphic artist making a pretty good living at that. And then all the uh, newspapers went away, and then all the uh, graphic arts jobs went away. So. I had to go back, uh, go back to school and do something else. But um, I started out in my career in graphic arts and talk briefly about this in the book. When I was about 10 or 11 years old, I developed an interest in black and white photography. Mm -hmm. I learned how to do double exposures and there's a technique called dodging where you can put uh, one object into another object, that sort of thing. And so because of that, I got fairly good at um, recognizing photo and video anomalies and there are softwares that you can buy now that you can run through. Um, in, in the age of deep fakes and all of that, um, videos are quite often used in court testimony. And um, they have people whose jobs is just to forensically analyze video footage right. to make sure it's not fake. So I'm not getting framed for oh, this video. Oops, this video of me uh, robbing a liquor store. Is that real or not? <laughs> you never so know. Yeah, so they have forensic people that can actually, there are software packages that can go in there and uh, mm -hmm. detect what's going on. Just to give you a basic example, um, talk about the uh, Gulf Breeze UFO sightings. Mm -hmm. um, I was living in Gulf Breeze at the time, and that just so happened to be when they were testing all the uh, stealth fighters at Eglin Air Force Base. And that could have been re uh, responsible for some of those UFO sightings. But uh, if you look at the Ed Walters book, uh, the Gulf Breeze UFO sightings, every one of the pictures of the UFOs, with one exception, is um, the UFO is always in a dark part of the sky. There's nothing in the background. Well, two exceptions. <laughs> so when you're doing double exposures, um, it's very easy to just um, stick a UFO image into a dark part of the sky because there's nothing overlapping if that makes sense. Now, uh, let me, let me, I probably should explain how you do double exposures to start with. You just uh, first create a model UFO and then you take a picture of it against a black background and then you uh, don't advance the camera forward. And this is back in the days before digital cameras. So everything was still on film. You don't advance the, the, the frame. You just take another picture using the same, uh, the same uh, slide there. And then you go out and take a picture of the night sky or take a picture of the landscape at night. And then the UFO picture is going to be in the background in a black spot on the landscape that you took. And people point out, well, it couldn't have been double exposures because it was Polaroid. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very simple matter to take a photograph with a regular camera, do a double exposure and then go have it developed and then take a Polaroid of the photo. <laughs> right. right. So that, that's a very easy technique. I mean, it takes a little finagling to get the lighting right and everything, but it's not, it's not that difficult to do. But if you look at all the uh, Ed Walters photographs, almost every one of them with a couple of exceptions um, have uh, the UFO in a part of the sky that's black. There's one where the tree overlaps the UFO, like the, the UFO is behind the tree mm, and it partially that overlaps on the edge. And uh, that's a very, I'm not saying that they did this, but I'm, I'm saying that it's possible. That it's very easy to go in there with a magic marker and draw in the tree um, or, you know, something along those lines. And the other one was where the UFO was hovering over the road. And if you look at the edges of that one, you can clearly see the background showing through on the, on the UFO. Sure. It's mm -hmm. a double exposure. 
plus just the fact that it's uh, very obviously paper plates. <laughs> that, that, Some, yeah, of those are are. Of. <laughs> Some of them are. Yeah, yeah. Um, and let's see, the next one, um, similarities to known hoaxes. That's uh, called the bandwagon. If, if um, one hoax happens and people figure out, hey, this is easy to do this this way, then a bunch of other people will hop on yes. and start doing the same thing. See that a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, next is sensational claims. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to say, uh, okay, I saw a strange light in the sky. It's another thing to say, I saw a strange light in the sky. Therefore, it came from Pleiades or from right. Reticuli or something like that. Um, apportion the claims to the evidence. You, you saw something in the sky. The U in UFO stands for unidentified. So right, right. it's not identified. Um, now, if an alien did come down and say, here, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm abducting you and take this book with you as proof, that sort of thing, then you've got some concrete evidence. Then you're into that close encounters of the two or three range. So the idea there is um, watch out for sensational claims. And mm -hmm. another thing, um, I call it clickbait language. Oh, yeah. Um, if you're on YouTube and they uh, find out what they don't want you to know, the government's covering this up, you know, that sort of thing to get you to click. Everybody. Or, you know, it could be the same in printed materials. If you okay. see a book title with all this stuff on it, uh, you know, the government's hiding this, that sort of thing. If they're trying to manipulate your emotions with those sensational claims, and it's a good idea to look at it a little more closely, not saying that it wouldn't be a hoax, but just saying, if it looks like a headline from the National Enquirer, yeah, yeah. You might, you might have was something that number going 10? On. Was the clickbait thing number 10, Charlton? Oh, uh, no, it was number eight. Oh, okay, go ahead. Um, yeah, there's two more. I'll, I'll kind of go through these. Lack of collaboration of, with authorities. Now, it depends on that, how much you trust the authorities. Right. But things like MUFON are authorities, too. So if you have a MUFON chapter and you ask them to come out and investigate. Um, I don't know that I trust them either. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm just using that as an example. If you yeah, if yeah. you have an authority that you trust, what do they say about it? And, and, it's, and at the same time, look at the authority and say, okay, do they uh, have any skin in the game? In other words, right. do they, they have an ulterior motive for saying something? Absolutely. And then number 10, what are the alternative explanations? Mm. Is it really an alien visitor or is it a teenager in a tinfoil outfit? There you go. <laughs> See, to me, those 10 are a perfect snapshot. You should uh -huh. make like a meme of them and just put them out uh, on the internet and just share the heck out of it. Because <laughs> if people don't want to be bothered taking the time to actually think about these things, they can just read those 10 yeah. things and then say, well, wow, that really makes sense to me. I love that. That was great. Oh, great. Thanks. Now, what do you think about the Miami? I, ha I had to ask you the whole Miami um, cryptid sighting that 80 police cars showed up to. And yeah, yeah. Um, and and that, that kind of goes back to the uh, I haven't really looked at that one enough to um, to make an informed decision yet. And, and what I mean by that is, uh, I mean, I'm aware of it. Uh, I don't like to render an opinion until I've gotcha. investigated it thoroughly. But uh, as far as cryptids go, um, I can give you just the general pros and cons of what Please I think do. about that. Uh, okay. Um, there are preachers that exist on the planet that we don't uh, know about. And uh, uh, there's a, the classic example is the coelacanth. That was a fish that was thought to be extinct. And, um, it, uh, they finally found it again and, and found out that, it, no, it's not extinct. We just thought it was. Um, things like Bigfoot, Sasquatch. There was actually um, a creature that lived at one point in time uh, called Gigantopithecus, which is just, uh, it just means a giant ape. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you look at the description of Gigantopithecus, it's basically Bigfoot. So mm -hmm. who's to say that um, they all died out? Who's to say that they're not living? I live in the Pacific Northwest, and you can't uh, you can spit out the window and hit something with a Sasquatch logo on it. You know, there's, uh, I should have worn my uh, stocking cap with the Sasquatch on the top. <laughs> but uh, I mean, Sasquatch is is big business here. Oh, yeah. um, Loch Ness. Um, there were plesiosaurs and things like that that uh, existed at one point in time that kind of looked like uh, Loch Ness monsters. So who's to say that they? 
went extinct, that sort of thing. We don't really know. There, the, there's a lot of um, animals, a lot of uh, creatures out there that we're discovering every day, and we don't really know all the potential life forms on Earth. So it could be that um, there are things that we haven't identified yet or we don't know about. So that's that's the pro evidence. The con evidence is um, how credible are the witnesses? How credible is the video? Uh, if 80 cops showed up, uh, they showed up for a reason, right? <laughs> they said they said yeah. it was supposedly right. teenagers with uh, sticks or some silly thing like that. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that's another thing too. Uh, if that's that's the official explanation, teenagers with sticks. How credible is that? Does that right. make sense? Does that sound like something? I mean, there was some blurry video of some cryptid. And it's, of course, it's always blurry. Mm -hmm. These are the things that make me crazy. We have, yeah. you know, $2,000 smartphones with amazing digital cameras on them. Yeah, and 4K videos, cameras. And <laughs> videos are blurry. Pictures are hazy. Everybody's bouncing their camera all over the place. Yeah, so that yeah. whole thing makes me nuts. But they did show um, some kind of cryptid looking creature in one of the videos. But again, you know, it was all blurry and stuff, yeah, but yeah. I mean, the only thing that makes me question that whole thing is mm -hmm. I've never, even, you know, at school things and terrible things like that. Uh -huh. I don't think I've ever seen 80 cop cars show up. Yeah. 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 So that that's a red flag for me. Yeah. Right and that, um, there are things, um, that go on that, um, th there's a government cover up. And then it turns out to be not what you thought it was. Um, right. There was an example. I think it was Philadelphia. I can't remember. Uh, I believe it was Philadelphia where they had the UFO that crashed in the late 60s, early 70s. And they had the government come in and shut down the area and all that. Um, mm. That sounds like a, a UFO sighting. What I think happened in that case was that it was a Russian um, spacecraft. Right with a Russian astronaut in it. That, uh, that makes <laughs> more sense, right? Yeah. yeah. But um, the point being that they the 80 cops could have been there because it was a cryptid. It could have been there because it was uh, some kind of government thing that they wanted, you know, covered up that we weren't. But at a with. mall? Yeah. It just yeah, the whole yeah. thing just uh -huh. really makes you wonder, like, and, and I saw a video of a um, some boy um, had a, he was, he was talking to his dad on a video chat and his dad was a cop who who reported to that mall and yeah. he was asking him dad tell me like what did you go there for what did you see and he and he didn't know he was being recorded the father and he said yeah. no i'm not allowed to talk about that i can't tell you to his yeah. own son so yeah. something went on there whether we'll ever find out or not is is a whole different you know yeah and that gets into the whole uh, men in black thing um right i mean that's what we're talking about things that are credible versus things that are not credible. Um, men in black, that uh, could possibly mm -hmm. be a government agency that is responsible for mm -hmm. hiding evidence of things that they don't want to know. Does that mean that they're always hiding evidence of UFOs? Not necessarily. Uh, it could be that there's um, something else going on, but it could also be that they're hiding evidence of UFOs. Um, there was one, and again, I'm, forgetting the exact specifics of it. <laughs> was a couple of ladies that were driving late at night and this UFO appeared to them and they looked out the window and, and I got burns on their face. And then I saw uh, that. And the UFO was being chased by a bunch of black helicopters. Um, my personal opinion on that is a thing called NERVA. And I can't remember exactly what NERVA stands for. It's nuclear energy, Anyway, basically what it is, it's a rocket engine that works off of nuclear power. Mm. And um, that would explain the radiation. And that was if it was a government thing that they were doing, that would explain the black helicopters. And maybe it was some secret technology that uh, the government was developing instead of aliens. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that all UFO sightings are secret government technology? Not necessarily. It just means, you know, that in this particular instance, that might have been some sort of a government thing that's going on. Right. And we do have some things that um, are being developed. And I talk about the black triangle in the book mm. that the sighting that I couldn't explain, I didn't know about the, uh, the big black uh, triangle thing. 
Um, now again, that that is something that's supposedly top secret. If it if it's not top secret, then uh, you'd know about it already. If that makes sense, we know about the stealth fighters. We know about the stealth bombers because they're no longer top secret. We don't know about what else the government might have. Right. So the black triangles could be government technology that we just don't know about. And True, but you think they would be a little more careful about where they fly these things instead of, yeah. you know, I don't know, some of it just doesn't make sense to me, but then the government doesn't make sense to me. So, yeah, <laughs> but I wanted, I wanted to touch back on Billy Meyer because sure. I interviewed Michael Horn, who's his like representative. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of Michael before, but yeah, um, I've watched it. I've seen yeah, it yeah, yeah, a lot of his videos. Um, you know, like I said, I, I, I just want people to, to, to find the truth for themselves, like make yeah, sense. Yeah. Of it. I'm not here to convince anybody and I'm sure you're not either, either yeah. way, but I like to have an option of what I choose to believe. So I, I just don't mm -hmm. want to be bombarded with like one side of the story. I want to, I want to yeah. see the whole thing. So, um, with Billy Meyer, like at first I was, you know, I kind of like bought into it. Mm -hmm. And it made sense to me. But then, I don't know, lately I'm kind of having my doubts about a lot of a lot of his methodology and belief system. Yeah, yeah. And you go into some of that a chapter in your book about Billy Meyer. And give give us your, your take on that. I know you said his wife, when they got divorced, she came out and said, you know, so that it was showed all, all the models. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just give us give us a little bit of overview on him because Okay. Um, back when I was a kid, um, I really fell in love with the idea of um, like George Adamski and Billy Meyer and all mm -hmm. these humanoid aliens who just happen to look exactly like us, uh, even right. though they allegedly evolved on another planet. Uh, and uh, some of them even look like the gold diggers from Dean Martin's TV yes. show. <laughs> like, let's talk about that for a second. Yeah, uh, sure. Let's talk uh, about that. Uh, what are they called? Plarens? I think they're called pl Plarens, I believe. Yeah. Plar yeah. Plarens or something like that. Yeah. But let's talk about the gold digger thing because a lot of people yeah. probably don't know what that is. Uh, well, um, back in the 70s, there were, Dean Martin had a show and he had a troop of dancers called the gold diggers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe it was some Jossie, uh, one, one of the Billy Meyer alleged alien contactees or contact people that contacted him from other planets were um, actually gold diggers. He, he presented photos of these people that he is supposed to have been talking to. And it turned out that they were actually people from uh, Dean Martin's TV show. So um, that was suspicious. But yeah. um, before all that happened, I was really interested in the Adamski message and the, and the Billy Meyer message and I, I totally agree with a lot of what they're saying, you know, that if uh, humanity doesn't change, we're going to yes. head down a very long and hard road. And uh, we have a perfect storm of things waiting on us, climate crises, uh, mm -hmm. population, hunger, uh, threats of war, all these things that are going on. Um, so I did, I was very attracted to that message back in the 70s, and I'm still very attracted to that, that message now. There's a thing called the genetic fallacy. Don't confuse the message with the messenger. Mm, <laughs> like that. The genetic fallacy comes from where the idea came from and and who the idea came from are two different things. Uh, the, the classic example is that uh, Adolf Hitler came up with the idea for a Volkswagen. Therefore, if you drive a Volkswagen, you must be a Nazi. <laughs> that's, that's a classic example of genetic fallacy. Just because... Yeah. A good idea comes from somebody who might not be so good. Right. Doesn't mean that the idea itself is bad. Right. right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so. You know, what so, gets me with him is mm -hmm. prophecies. They, you know, they, he predicted these prophecies way before they, they came to fruition. And that keeps me glued yeah. in. Yeah. Um, there are, um, you know, that could be a whole other show there about the yeah. psychology of how prophecies work. Um, so for example, if I, uh, if I'm in the restaurant and I order a steak and uh, the waitress brings me a steak and I, I, okay. My wife and I are at a restaurant. I tell her, I predict in the future, someone is going to bring me a steak. And then the waitress comes up and I order a steak and then she brings me a steak. Was I a prophet? <laughs> if I predict that the sun's going to come up tomorrow, it might not. And then, you know, the planet could blow up or whatever. 
Yeah. But the odds are pretty pretty darn good that uh, the sun's going to come up tomorrow. And if if it doesn't come up tomorrow, there's not going to be anybody there to know that my prophecy was wrong anyway. Right, right. <laughs> I don't know, but some of his prophecies were really like yeah. spot on and they were pretty detailed. They weren't like vague or anything like yeah. that. And and you have to also look at how the, those were re you can retrofit. Um, True. One, of the, one, of the, one of the things I um, let me see if I can. OK, let's let's do this one. Um, I have some friends that are uh, pagans. They worship the goddess, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, if I told you that every fairy tale is a prophecy of the goddess, that must mean that the goddess is real because how could every fairy tale ever written be a prophecy of the goddess unless the goddess invented all fairy tales and therefore that makes the goddess real? Mm. So then what I do is say, okay, tell me a fairy tale and I'll show you how it's a prophecy of the goddess and you can name any fairy tale. And then what I can do is take it and twist it and turn it and, and, and spin it so that it sounds like a prophecy of the goddess. Mm. And so there's my proof. All fairy tales are prophecies of the goddess. Therefore the goddess must be true. So you can take and, and spin and uh, retrofit things into making it look like a prophecy when it might not be. Also, there's the, the possibility of how are these sources being shown? Uh, I saw, what was his name, Michael? Mm. He was talking about copyright or something like that. Yes. And again, um, how do we know? Was that actually a copyright or was it Michael saying that there was a copyright? Well, he, we also copyright? That, yeah. he also claimed that he also claimed that as far as the photographs go, that he has many authorities to say that none of these were photoshopped or duped. And there was, of course, no technology like that when the photographs were taken. But he he's got like unsurmountable proof that these yeah. are legit photographs and some he's of the, the photographs. Authority. Exactly. Well, <laughs> he, he does. He does mention Mm -hmm. I can tell you offhand, but he does mention that that he's you know he's got people that would document that those are I, some of those photographs just look really fake to me. Like yeah, yeah, they just do. And mm -hmm. um, I always ask Michael why um, why didn't he take pictures of the inside of the ship? So Michael had said, well, he did, but. He gave you a perspective of like he was up in 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 the sky, not in space, but like in the sky, yeah. and he took pictures of other UFOs on on his level. So you didn't see the inside of the ship, but like say I held my camera to my car window and mm. and took pictures. But yeah. a lot of a lot of people that leave comments were asking me like these types of questions, mm. and I just never got a definitive answer. Like why not? take a picture of the console of the ship like yeah, oh, yeah. Actually, you know what i mean a lot of it is just and another thing crazy. Um, what was the number one what was the purpose of the aliens letting him take pictures of of their ships number two why is it that nobody else in the uh world has taken the exact same pictures of the exact same right. ships Good besides point. him and um, I like to look at it like uh, you're talking about, you know, some of them look fake and some of them don't look fake. Yeah. Uh, I, I was at a art show once and, uh, you know, just kind of um, I'm, I'm an amateur artist myself, you know, graphic artist. I like to paint. I like to draw. And I'm looking at all these great, fantastic pieces of artwork. And I was talking to one of the artists that had done this fantastic drawing or painting. And I said, I wish I could do things like that. And and I wish that I, I had the talent to be able to do something as well as you did it. And she said, oh, you probably do. This is the good one. You don't see the 500 stuck in the studio in the corner right. that I threw in the trash can. <laughs> so true. So, so, you know, it might be three or four. You might take 5,000 fake UFO pictures, and then there's three or four of them that actually go, wow, that looks really, really great. Uh, you know, you know, it's crazy when you, you think about one. Billy Meyer because he uh, spent, what is he, in his 80s now? So he spent yeah. like a lifetime dedicated to, to to this and writing, you know, numerous amount of books and, yeah, yeah. and feeding this out to that. And I know he had a church 
or some type of um yeah, the some Jesse center or something yeah like see that. i don't like yeah. that too yeah, much yeah. either but and that's the thing um what are they getting out of it right and uh are they asking for donations there was uh another i, I go back to the ed walters book they, they had a foreword by um bud hopkins bud hopkins for those of you who don't know is a ufo investigator um he wrote a foreword to this book and in the book he said uh well ed walters i believe him because he had nothing to gain by coming out and and, and talking about all this and in the very next paragraph he said that the reason ed walters contacted him in the first place was that he got a six-figure offer for a book deal and he oh, wanted geez. to you know no, wait a minute <laughs> Something doesn't well, doesn't can compute here. So so I mean it doesn't have to be financial. It could be just for the attention. Um, I mean, if you've ever been on the internet for more than five minutes, <laughs> you know that trolls love attention. And absolutely. there are people who just like to get attention. Absolutely. Um, some of the stuff, if you look at the Billy Myers um early, and again, not connecting too many dots here. I'm just presenting the information for your consideration. Uh Billy Meyer was arrested. I think it was petty theft or I, I forgot what it was, but he committed a burglary and he was sentenced mm -hmm. to prison. He escaped from prison, went to another country and was um, arrested again. So he escaped that prison and went and joined the foreign legion. Right. And then when he came back, um, he started having contact with UFOs and um, the, uh, I forgot what the exact nature of the offense was. I think I mentioned it in the book. But um, it had some element of hoaxing and conning. It might have been forgery. I forgot what it was. But it was something yeah. along the lines of trying to uh, fake things. Um, and uh, well, with my whole thing with Billy Meyer, I, I mean, I, I read all the alleged prophecies and everything, too. And one of the things, um, I, I, I saw all the photos in the books. And uh, then one day I saw a photo and I think I mentioned it in, in the book. And the photo is very obviously the lid from a licorice container. My grandfather owned a little I gas station. I read that. Yeah, I read that yeah. in your book. I was blown yeah. away by that. Yeah. So so what is it? It's a licorice container? Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've ever been in the... This would have been the late 60s, early 70s, back in the day when they had the old country stores. My grandfather was a farmer, but he also had a little country store. And they had these big glass containers on the shelves that had like licorice or, or gum drops or lemon drops or, you know, that sort of thing. And he used to reach in there and grab a handful of candy and then he would weigh it and you know, pay him for it and put it in the bag. There was, I think it was Red Vines was the, the brand name. I can't remember, but it was a glass jar. It was maybe two or three gallon glass jar and it had a lid on top of it. Uh, it was a metal lid because this was back in the days before plastic became popular. And um, I, I was really all on board with Billy Meyer and I was eating up every word. Yes, we are headed for global disaster and all that stuff. And then I flipped to that page and wait a minute, that looks an awful lot like <laughs> that licorice lid <laughs> at my grandfather's store. <laughs> and then the more I, I started looking, really, really, really looking at the photographs, the more it was like, okay, there's not something, something's not quite right here. And um, so that was kind of my first, uh, the beginning of, the downfall of Billy Meyer. Oh, all over a licorice lid. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that, I mean, that was kind of the catalyst. It started me looking more closely at, uh, that was about the same time that I got interested in photography. So I started looking at the ways that this could be done. And, um, uh, some of the other ones like the wedding cake photo, if you look more closely, yeah, if that you first one, look at it. Yeah. That one's no good to me. <laughs> yeah, if you first look at it, it looks pretty impressive. But then you, the more you look at it, okay, that's obviously a trash can lid. And and it? Michael did go over that in detail. Um, yeah, you know he kind of debunked that. You know, and yeah. after Michael talks, I you know he's he's got a way to make me go, okay, that makes sense. You know, that makes sense. So I'm trying yeah. to sort through the whole thing myself, and I figure, you know, if other people can get some insight from it, then it's worth mm. talking. You know, talking about for sure. Yeah. One of the things uh, that's kind of off-putting for me as a as a therapist, and this goes back to the Darvo thing that we were talking about earlier, um, I notice um, whenever Michael speaks, 
that uh, he has a tendency to call people stupid or morons or things like that if they disagree with him. Yeah. And that's that's classic Darvo, deny, attack, and reverse the victim and the yeah. offender. And uh, that, I mean, not saying that, you know, he's what he's saying isn't real, but just saying that if it was real, you wouldn't have to call your opponent stupid. And, I hear you. Yeah. You know, and it's funny because people will leave comments about that on my videos. Yeah. Yeah. And not that I'm defending him, but I think you get to a point where you, you kind of get tired of like trying to make your case and and people leave yeah. so many nasty, rude comments, too. And I think it just gets to you. And maybe yeah, that's yeah. Michael's frustration. I'm not speaking for Michael, trust me, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> just knowing him and talking to him, yeah. you know, I, I, I can see that. But um, because everybody well, has an thing, opinion. Uh, you know? Yeah, the, the thing there is that if, if it is just his frustration, he should probably be aware of that how it comes across. Because right. There's, there's one thing to be uh, frustrated and say, well, that's just stupid. But when you start the, 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 the second part of Darvo, the reverse victim and offender, uh, where anybody who denies what I'm saying is just stupid and 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 they're they're making me the victim here they're they're persecuting mm. me that sort of thing I really like that that's, that's classic gaslighting um and uh, gaslighting is um what uh, well not saying that Michael is an abuser but gaslighting is what abusers use to turn the tables on the victim to right. make the victim believe that they deserve to be abused to make the victim believe that uh, they're the ones that caused all of this. And again, not saying that that's the being abusive, but it's a yeah. technique that comes very close to what abusers do, if that makes sense. And you would know, I mean, you've had a lifetime of uh, dealing with it. So yeah. What about, um, I appreciate your time here. And like yeah, I said, no there's so many questions for you. Maybe we could do a follow-up too, because I still sure. have a whole bunch of questions, but um, I wanted to talk briefly about Area 51, too, because mm -hmm. I just spoke with another gentleman who claimed that there was another crash sighting in Magdalena, which is like right outside of there. Yeah, and John that it, Stewart, was it? Yeah, John Stewart. Very good. Yeah, yeah, He's yeah, a great yeah. guy. Great guy. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to just talk to you about Area 51. Um, mm -hmm. Let's just give us your 30,000 foot view on that whole thing, too. Um, well, my uncle was... Uh, a colonel in the air force. <laughs> wow. So I know that there were some things going on in the area 51. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he actually, uh, his last job in the military, he, he commanded, uh, he was over a station in Biloxi, Mississippi. And, uh, that was about the time that project Aurora was going on. I don't know if you're familiar with that. I've heard of it. About that. Basically that was, uh, supposedly something that didn't exist, uh, a black triangle, uh, military project that was designed to be able to fly at incredible speeds. And it was just like the, uh, it was like the uh, descendant of the SR 71 program, which was a spy recon aircraft that I actually saw and thought it was a UFO in the seventies, because back then they denied that it existed. Mm. And uh, then we found out later that it did. Uh, my father used to do contract work for a uh, Redstone arsenal in Huntsville, Alabama. And if you go to the U.S. Uh, Space Flight Museum there, there's an SR-71 out front on the lawn in the parking lot. Um, so you can see one now. But um, Aurora was allegedly tested at uh, Area 51. Mm -hmm. I asked my uncle about it one time. I said, I mean, Area 51, do they actually have Aurora? Um, you know, were they testing that out there? And he gave me the standard military response. I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the nephew he's talking to. <laughs> mm, funny. So there is something going on at Area 51. What it is, I have no idea. Um, the They did test. I mean, we have knowledge that they did test the U-2 spy plane there. Uh, I think, talk about that briefly in the book, that uh, they finally came out under a freedom of information thing, I think, in the 90s. And uh, admitted that the U-2 plane was tested there. Mm -hmm. uh, the pictures in the book um, of Area 51, my daughter took those. They went out there, her and her uh, the fiance at the time, now her husband, went out to Area 51 and took a bunch of pictures. And they had some strange things happen to them. They were, um, she had a GoPro and she was doing some video right there at the gate. And the GoPro went dead 
and it's never worked since. Um, so wow. I don't know if they have some kind of EMP technology there to prevent you from, but they've got a big sign there that says uh, photography is prohibited, you know, and, and mm -hmm. assuming that you go through the gate, that's when the photography is prohibited. But apparently mm -hmm. if you run a GoPro within 500 yards of the gate, <laughs> they, zap it. they zap it, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. So as far, I mean, uh, uh, as far as Area 51, yes, it does exist. Uh, yes, they do test top secret military projects out there. Could that fall into the purview of something from Roswell? Possibly. Could it fall into, you know, having uh, reverse engineering alien technology? Possibly. Um, show me the evidence. And uh, what's his name? Um, Lazar, Bob Lazar. <laughs> I was just going to ask about him because that broke my heart yeah. when I, after I read what you yeah. read. Yeah, I, I was I was on the Bob Lazar bandwagon there yeah, for a while too. Um, and then I started. Uh, I saw him on an interview, and like I said, you know, therapists, especially when we work with court, we get some training on how to detect uh, if somebody's fibbing or not. And uh, there was all the red flags going on. You could probably use a Bob Lazar interview to train therapists on how to detect if somebody's not telling. Oh, isn't you. that heartbreaking? I was so on on board with yeah. him. Like yeah and i was too i mean he he was one of the more credible ones yeah uh, but uh you know <laughs> didn't he have criminal trouble too i mm -hmm. i could have sworn read that in your book that he had yes he uh, he was actually uh running a prostitution ring yeah, crazy. <laughs> in the las vegas i think it was yeah crazy. <laughs> yeah and um nobody has been able to verify one of, one of the things that he claims to have degrees from mit and caltech right and then uh, when independent investigators um, started looking into it, um, he um, said, well, the government just erased my, my transcripts. Oh, um, I don't, I have my little screenshot up right now, but if you can see the room I'm in, uh, I have my diplomas on the wall. Uh, I was very proud to get that and I framed it and stuck it on the wall and it's been there ever since. And yeah, now we just see your background, the space. Yeah. Background. Yeah. I, I, I could probably turn it off if you, but I, yeah. No, we believe <laughs> me, you. I have a doctorate back there. Um, <laughs> Trust me. I believe the, <laughs> the point is if you pay a hundred thousand dollars for grad school and you get this piece of paper, you probably oh, want to keep it. I mean, so I, even I have my if, master's degree and I still keep my diplomas framed. I, yeah. I yeah. <laughs> the point to all that is if the government erased all of uh, Lazar's transcripts, correct? Uh, does he not have, did they erase his diploma too? Did they break into his house and steal his right. diplomas off the wall? Um, right. Or does he just not care about it enough to, you know, if you have a degree from Caltech, wouldn't you want to exactly. <laughs> frame it and hang it on the wall? Uh, that sort of thing. So, and again, I mean, not saying that he doesn't have a degree, just saying that, um, weighing all the evidence which is more likely if that makes sense oh that make well after i read that in your book i was like gosh it makes some and and you you have like these aha moments you know yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was great. great but i, I do but, think as far as uh, area 51 goes yeah they, they have acknowledged it now it used to be that it was blacked out on uh google earth now you can go in there and see it. i can't remember if i included that picture in the book or not but there's a, you can go on Google Earth and see Area 51 now. Um, the, that used to not be the case. So what I suspect is that it's outlived its usefulness and mm -hmm. they have some other base somewhere else that we don't Broom know. Broom Lake or something? Groom Lake? Yeah, yeah Broom, Broom Lake, yeah. Yeah. Broom Lake. yeah. 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 So, you know, did they test things? I mean, if if, if there was, let's let's put it this way. If I had uh, a UFO or alien bodies or whatever, and I wanted to uh, study them in secret, that would be the number one place on the list to go do it. Mm. Um, places so remote that people that work there have to be flown in on a, yeah. on a military jet. <laughs> so um, it's, it's uh, probably one of them was at one time, time, one of the most secure locations to do something like that. And mm -hmm. I think over time, as it got more and more popular and people found out about it, and then, you know, they had the few years ago, they were all going to storm area 51 mm -hmm. and make them reveal yeah. all the secrets. So that's a little too, uh, it's a, it's too much of a hot spot now. And, and so they probably moved to another location somewhere else. To oh, guaranteed. That. Guaranteed. Yeah. One of the domes somewhere. Deep yeah. underground military bases. That's all you hear about now are these domes <laughs> yeah. on the ground and, 
Yeah, yeah. Well, there's aliens and cryptids living down there, and yeah, yeah. I don't know. I just want to make sense of it, you know, especially this UFO stuff. And then they change it to UAP, and then they change yeah. uh, even UAP. They changed it was uh, unidentified aerial to anomalous. They change. It's like yeah, I, yeah. it all seems like a big psyop to me. It really does. Yeah, yeah, and and that's uh, that's one of those PR things that uh and, and and i i always tell people i'm old school i use ufo <laughs> but whether you're using ufo or uap or whatever remember what the u stands for <laughs> unidentified <laughs> right right i'm waiting i mean if if they uh if they identify it sure if aliens uh, show up and uh and uh give us credible plausible evidence of their existence then it's no longer a ufo it's no longer a UAP. That's correct. No, what it is. That's correct. Now, as far as what I actually believe about all that, mm -hmm. uh, I do believe that there's probably some sort of alien contact going on. Um, mm -hmm. Why don't we know more about it? Um, if you have, I mentioned this in the book. If you've ever watched Star Trek, they have something called the Prime Directive. Yes. Um, we don't want to interfere in an alien civilization because it'll uh, mess up their development. Um Anytime on Earth, just from Earth um, standards, anytime a more advanced or technologically advanced civilization has had contact with a less technical, technologically advanced civilization, it hasn't turned out too well. And that's just with a you know a couple of hundred years of technological development. Yeah. Imagine contact with a civilization that might have millions or even billions of years of technological advancement over us. How so that is that be. your belief? Do you believe that... There are quite possibly these um, more advanced civilizations and they're using this prime directive theory. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about the uh, fact that we've seen them flying over nuked, uh, um, nuclear centers where we keep our nukes and they deactivate them? I yes, mean, those yes. stories are everywhere. Do you believe those as well? Yes. Um, and let, let me, before, let me clarify a previous point before I go on to that. Um sure. I like to draw the distinction between what I believe and what I can prove. <laughs> so, yes, I do believe that uh, there might be alien contact going on at some level, some way. Um, can I prove it? No. Um, so there's a difference there. Uh, if I could prove it, then I, I will be the first to let you know that, Hey, this is the, <laughs> and, but, um, the, now on to the uh, idea of um, the nukes being turned off or shut down. That uh, to me is one of the most credible pieces of evidence ah. we have, because if you think about it, um, let's let's just for a moment look at the pros and cons. Suppose it's not a UFO, then that means that some government somewhere on Earth has the ability to send some kind of a probe over to a nuclear facility mm -hmm. in the United States and shut down our nukes. Would that be something that the U S government might be interested in? <laughs> would that be something they would want to keep from happening? <laughs> so that to me is a good indication that um, there might be something to this UFO phenomena and the government might know something about it because they don't, uh, they're not more aggressively investigating it, if that makes sense, or at least not in the public eye, more aggressively investigating it. Because if it was Russia or China or somebody that was turning off our nukes, that would be priority number one. There would be debates on the floors of Congress about how do we stop this? You would think. It's just been swept under the rug. Right. <laughs> yeah. How many accounts of, of those uh, deactivating nukes things? I mean, I think I saw at least yeah. two. There have been several. I don't. I don't have an exact count, but I know that yeah, there's, there's been, been a few, many. right? Yes, uh huh. Quite a few. I know that blows me More away. Than a dozen. Yeah. Now, also, I haven't looked into the credibility of all of them, and and you know how much. There's a difference between. I, I go back to the Bob Lazar example. Mm -hmm. uh, he he um, he says that all these people have this information about this and that. Mm -hmm. We don't have statements from all these people that he says have information. We just have right. Bob Lazar's word that all these people have information. So in some of the cases with the uh, nukes being deactivated, um, 
we had just have the statement of one um, guy from a missile silo that said this has happened. We don't have corroborating witnesses saying that. We have him saying that there were corroborating witnesses, but we don't have actual statements or actual opportunity or contact information for the other people that he alleges were actually there. So that that's the big difference in that. I keep harping on that because that's one of the big things that keeps showing up um, a lot of the time is that we have these experts that have seen this. And um, then you question them a little more closely. Okay, well, can I get information or statements from these expert witnesses? And then they tend to evaporate. What about the one that just had the congressional hearing? What was his name again? Mm. Just had a brain for it. Um, I know. Yeah, I can't. I know talking, about. talking about. Yeah, you know, the guy. The the, the, the uh, was uh, it Gr 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 I think it was. <laughs> Is it with a G? It's, it's going to drive me yeah, up. Yeah, um, yeah. I know who you're talking about. I you just know who I'm talking about. I yeah. mean, he seemed pretty credible. Um, yeah, yeah. He seemed like a pretty credible. And then they wouldn't give him that room to, like, go and explain further. Like, it seems like they kind of stopped him in his tracks. And yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. What do you think about that whole testimony? Did you think it was um, legit or saying I mean, that I think, I, think there was some, I think there was some meat on the bones. Yeah. I'll weigh it in the, um, the first thing to do. Is follow the money. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't necessarily have to be money. It could be. Is there any political advantage to him doing this now? And there may or may not be. Is I it David Kushner? No. See, it's going to drive me nuts now. I'll, I'll get yeah. his name. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> so, so you think there was some um, financial motivation? Not necessarily uh, financial, uh, but it could be political motivation. Political motivation. Yeah. And I, I don't want to come out and definitely say that's what it is because I haven't investigated enough to. Right. Uh, but I mean, the, there was some credibility to what he was saying, too, as far as uh, yeah. was it eight, eight trillion dollars that went missing yeah. uh, off the top. And it's going to some black op somewhere that we don't know about. It's so it's not like one of the, one of the big comments I always get is if I say, okay, I'm not, I'm not convinced that Aylton Roswell was a cover up or if this was not, you know, that sort of thing. If I just come out and say, I'm not, I don't think the government was involved in this. Then the usual response I get, I guess you just believe everything the government tells you. Don't you? Yeah. Right. Sure. No, yeah. I don't. <laughs> I'd like to know where that $8 trillion of my money went. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's yeah, like a astounding um, amount of money to just be. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the thing that got me too is he said that there was like collateral damage and, and you mm. know, dead aliens and stuff. And I'm like, yeah. what in God's name is happening? That's, uh, and that, that's kind of, um, that's one of those, uh, things that I can't really say that I yeah. know what I believe at this point. Because on the one hand, um, I, I do believe, I'd like to believe that, um, uh, we have some sort of alien bodies or something like that. On the other hand, um, one of the one of the big things that I have with the UFO crashes and everything, if you ever look into the physics of what it takes to travel light years yeah. in the span of a human lifetime, like the nearest neighbor we have is Alpha Centauri and it's over four light years away. Mm -hmm. uh, in order to have a radio conversation with Alpha Centauri, it would take eight years, four years for us to send the message and four years for the reply to come back and what has happened in the eight years and in, in between. So if, if all of that, the amount of technology it would take to, to travel those vast distances, they've traveled hundreds of light years to earth and then they fail to stick the landing and crash. <laughs> to me, great. that just doesn't seem credible. I mean, it's just possible from, from occasion. And again, that depends on, how many of these craft are coming? How? Yeah. Um, and and if they're coming they're, into you know, dimensionally through wormholes or something where it's easier for yeah. them. I mean, we don't know. Yeah. It's all speculation. But I also yeah. wanted to talk to you about um, some of the stuff like these cow mutilations. I, I mean, uh -huh. I know I know that could be a whole segment in and of itself. Charlton, how about we schedule yeah. another conversation soon? I would really, really yeah. like to do that yeah. if that's OK with you. Yeah, that'd be fine. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, well, yeah, I won't bore your listeners with working out the details, but we can we can email. Yeah, no, when, yeah. when we end this call, don't hang up and we'll we'll tweak it out. Okay. But um, sure. I just want to thank you so very much for over the over sure. an hour of time you gave. And I, I again, I loved your book. I highly recommend Thanks. it. I will put links to where folks can pick one up. Now, um, 
Is it sold on Amazon as well, or is it just through the URL that you gave me? It's uh, Amazon as well. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, we'll make sure we get that link from you because it okay. was so comprehensive and so eye opening, it's so well written. And I just absolutely yeah. loved it. Thank you for writing that. It was great. Sure. Thanks for the opportunity. I uh, really enjoyed it and looking forward to doing it again sometime. <laughs> Definitely soon. Thank you, everyone. If you have any questions, you can leave them in the comments below. And I'm sure Charlton will get to be answering them at some point. Definitely. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.